There we go. All right, so today's Tech Talk is about vibrant site design for today's world. And, and what I really mean about that is we're designers. We're engineers, we're architects, land planners, uh, even developers. We're all looking at how can we not just design a project, but how can we get the intent across? And we need, need to do this by delivering not just better results, but more like 3D, more reality, more giving people the understanding of what the intent of our design is. So with SiteOps, uh, it's all about creating a model. And I'm going to use a little bit of LuminRT as part of this today. And we're going to talk about how to take a site design from just being a typical line drawing and how can we quick and easily convey the design intent across to the client to get buy-in on a project. So our agenda today is we're going to talk about imagination. We're going to look at a workflow for creating that vibrant design. Then we're going to demo about site ops and LuminRT. I actually want to show you how easy this workflow actually is. It's not hard. It's very simple. Uh, exceeding client expectations. And, of course, we'll always end this with questions uh, at the very end. The true sign of intelligence is knowledge is not knowledge, but imagination. Let's be honest. If you've passed a PE exam, if you've passed exams to become an architect, uh, in the industry, land planners, landscape architects, we are smart people. What we, again, want to be able to do is use our imagination. And when I mean imagination, our job is to solve problems, right? We're problem solvers. So we're always looking for the best way to solve a problem. And to solve that problem, we need to be able to spend more time on looking at options and less time on drafting. Let's be honest. We come up with way more ideas than we're ever, ever able to deliver because of a lot of times of what we use. I mean, in the old days, if, when I had a company, for example, it was still fairly common. We met for lunch. We took out a napkin, client nine, and we sit down and started drawing up some ideas. And then I would take that back, maybe put some onion skin over tax map and go from there. I'm that old. But in today's world, we can still get that same quick preliminary results, but with a lot better results, a lot better looking. And when you talk about imagination, you're going to see today a workflow that's going to allow you to start using that imagination. What if we did this one thing? What if we did that? A lot of times the client thinks they know what they want, right? If they knew what they want, then they, may not, they probably wouldn't come to us at all to help them figure out how to do the project. They don't. It's our job as design professionals to help them decide what's the best thing to do for their situation, for their program, or however they want to call it. How can they then sell that design to stakeholders, the bank, who they're renting or selling to, uh, municipalities. You know, we got planning boards for some of us. That's our worst enemy in this industry. How about thinking about we got to convey those design intents to them? Sometimes that's the hardest people to win over. So we're going to talk about that. So the big thing is how do we get our design intent across? Because we go through many iterations. Whether I've talked to people, they go, oh, I only do two or three. Reality is they do 20 or 30 getting to those two or three that they present. There's a difference between how many iterations you go through in design and how many you present. I'm going to show you a workflow today that's just really simple. And the odds are you're going to present way more than the two or three you typically take. Because I don't know how many times over the last 10 years we're dealing with this site ops technology. I've talked with users. They said, you know what, I went in, I showed the client. To the first two or three or four they wanted, then I pulled out just a, a fifth option, a wild card. Just said, hey, I was thinking out of the box. I can save you a little money. We can do this. Almost every time, because they can save money and still get what they want, the client chose it. So part of this workflow we're going to talk about, and again, this is the, the big buzzword or the term that everybody uses and they love to use nowadays is BIM. Okay? And that's great. It's a phenomenal way of thinking. It is definitely the future. Everybody working in a model, a common data structure, everything like that. But one of the biggest things we don't see in BIM and is really being struggled to be supported is true sight, um, especially in that very beginning stage. I see a lot of people use BIM products uh, like Revit or AcoSim or some other ones that are out there. And sight is still part of their mindset, but it's, I'll be honest, it's almost like an afterthought. What if I could take their building, their BIM model and relate it to mine 
and produce something that's again a deliverable based on the site. We're going to show you how to do that. So we're going to start looking at again, you know, BIM. Here's a good example of a tool. Most people think of BIM from architectural, structural, mechanical, electrical. Again, the site is the back end side of it. We're going to think of it more like this. So I'm going to go back one slide. I want you to take a picture of this snapshot of that building right there on the left-hand side. And if you look on the right, same building. And then there's some other models in there as well. This was done in SiteOps in about an hour and a half. We were able to do the layouts, the grading, budgets, stormwater. We were able to place the cars, trees, buildings, everything be able to present to a client do we want to do this version we ran another version where in the upper top area we went in and put residential instead of a park again letting them decide what's the best thing to do but they can only do that if we bring the information forward so the workflow again if you've seen site ops you've seen this workflow because this is where we dominate uh, we are the only two out there we are patented in this area that we really take control of that initial uh, conceptual site design. So, site ops is going to help you. If you don't have data, you're going to get it. We want to do a 2D design of our project. We want to do parking lots, roadways, buildings, sidewalks. Again, all kind of different scenarios. Then we need to grade it because we got to be able to build it. Right? No design is good unless it's economically feasible and it's constructible. We're going to make sure that happens. Then we can do some stormwater on that. Again, stormwater is the same thing. How can it work to be constructed? How can it be worked financially? And we're going to get a budget that we can prove our design with. That is just not fictitious. It's not what we think. It's hard numbers. I know exactly how much cut and fill and erosion and sediment and retaining walls. And then, of course, we want to get stakeholder comments. Personally, I've done hundreds of projects when I, we owned a company. And I don't know that I ever got one through the first time. Everybody's got to say something. And we want to take that input back. And then we want to recycle this whole thing, do revisions till we get the stakeholder happy. But a lot of times in that stakeholder area, it's not that I did a bad design. It's not that I didn't do what was asked. It's they don't understand what they're looking at. Again, I imagine most of you, just like me, you go in front of government groups, planning boards, uh, community boards. If you're doing something with a DOT, for example, I know uh, I used to go out with uh, my cousin who was a DOT commissioner for North Carolina to see how he did some of his things years ago, and he would just get onslaughted by hundreds of people. And most of it was they didn't understand what they were looking at. And once somebody really took the time to convey that to them, most of the time they went away. They were fine. They just didn't understand. So over the past year or so, SideOps has really been working with LuminRT, and we're creating these vibrant designs to go and be able to deliver what can be done on a project. That's the whole goal, right? Getting that buy-in. Because no matter how good it looks, even if it's economical, clients happy, if we don't have full stakeholder buy-in, the project's not going to change. Or worse yet, it's going to keep revising and revising and revising. And I don't know anybody who gets rich doing revisions. They're just very painful. It's a necessity in business. And we're going to try to stop that. So what we're going to look at is almost basically is BIM for civil site. So you can see a building there in the middle. It's done with AucoSim. It's a fantastic product. It makes a fantastic building. I wanted to put it on a site. I have context capture data in there. You can actually see in the upper right, we have the train going across that existing bridge. We went into the site plan. We added the trees to the cars, the trees, the site plan, the grading. All that was done in site ops and then put out to Lumen RT with the building on the pad. Yeah, this is a way better model. And imagine a 3D model to be able to help sell this project than if I had a flat 2D where maybe I colored green for grass and gray for parking and the building's a color. So let's go look at how you get to something like this, because that's what a lot of us want. This is what, when I had a company for years, I would, I would pay somebody to do this for us half the time. I, I dreamed of having that skill set, and now I actually do. It's actually a pretty simple skill set, and, and I love to, to go out and talk about it. So let's just log into SiteOps. For ones who haven't seen, it's a SaaS model software. Um, very simple, very easy. I'm not going to go in every uh, pick and click inside SiteOps. Uh, plenty of uh, videos out there, and also if you want to know, I always tell everybody, just get a hold of me, um, david.sotomayorbentley.com, and you can, I will always be glad to show it to you one-on-one -on -one or to your company. I love talking about site ops, as you can probably tell. So let's jump in to my Tech Talk area. I'm going to go in, and let's just start a new one. I want to show you how easy it is to get started. Then we're going to open one up that's had about 30 minutes worth of work on it. So let's just go in, and let's just grab some information. Now, 
normally I don't have a site set for when we start doing uh, tech talks and things to show site ops just because I like to show how fast it is. Most of us go in a client's office or talk to them the first time. We don't know what they want. In this case, I set something up um, just so I can make sure I had everything y'all needed. So we're going to Seahawk Way. Um, that's the other side of it. Let me just back out so I can get to the right one. There we go. All right, so I'm just going to let this catch up. Sorry about that. My machine's just going a little slow. That is not the one we want. Let me just zoom back out and I can go in and grab it again. It's right here. It's playing with me this afternoon. There we go. There's the Seahawk way we're looking for. And this is a typical thing. A client comes in, says they want to do a project. So I want to come in. They want to do, let's say in this case, we want to do maybe some mid to low rise multifamily. Again, it could be office buildings. It could be any type of project. Industrial, uh, the McDonald's on the corner. I've seen it using nuclear actor pad design, uh, wastewater treatment plants. You name it out there, it's there. So let's go in and grab a USGS topo. And let's go grab some Esri data. Anything you see inside SiteOps I use other than LuminRT comes with SiteOps. I'm not grabbing uh, any other third-party software except, again, for the LuminRT part of this, what I'll show. So here's the project. If I had GIS data, I could bring that in, uh, shape files, things like that. But what I've done is I've ultimately created a model. We're, we're going to work from a model as we go through this whole uh, exercise over the next probably 15 minutes or so. So I grab that image, and if I go look at our 3D viewer, Again, I've created a model that I'm going to start working on. Well, for example, when it grades, it's going to grade this model. When I do uh, piping, it'll work with piping. Let's go in. Let's draw a boundary. We're going to draw something really quick. Turn off some layers. And let's just come in. And let's draw a boundary. Now, you could all, by all means, you could import a boundary. And that's really one of the ways we prefer um, as you go along. And one thing I want to bring up, ask questions as you go along, because I would definitely want to come in and try to answer anything you can um, as we go through this uh, tech talk. Hey, David, speaking of questions, we have one. Um, will SiteOps read LiDAR data? Yes, um, there's a few different formats. Um, definitely some I'll send, we'll send an answer offline. Um, but we do have the ability to read some LiDAR data. But one thing it will not do is it will not process the LiDAR data. So, for example, it will assume all the points can be made to use as a surface. It will not go in and know the difference between the top of a tree and existing ground. Uh, there will have to be some processing done with that as well. So, again, uh, if you want to talk about that sort of offline, we can get to a lot more detail. But that's something we are definitely working on progressing forward with SiteOps is, is dealing more and more with LiDAR data. Uh, and, we, again, we do deal with context capture data. So if you want to import, uh, if you're dealing with the droning, you're getting those 3MX files that are coming out of, and 3SM files that are coming out of the uh, droning uh, industry that's coming around. We can accept those as well. So we've already we're a little ahead on that one um, as you go forward. So site ops. Let's just go real quick again, especially for the ones who've never seen it. I want to get everybody understanding what it does and why you'd want to use a tool like this. So I downplayed the image in the back just so we can see a little better. Again, it's all about us. It's all about me. It's all about my abilities, my skill sets that I've learned to design. So I want to come in and create things. For example, if I want to just come in and say, hey, I just need a parking lot. And for most of us, I use this because it's very easy to understand. Nothing sophisticated about this parking lot until we start having to change things. As we change and move, and I'll try to do this sort of slow because we're, we're using a, an online meeting. But as I change something, it changes. It knows how I want the project to start working. I've set defaults, you know, 9 by 18 parking spaces, 24-foot drive aisles, but I can always deviate from that. So if I want a, an aisle, for example, right in the middle that's 32 feet for some reason, I can do that. Now, if you see, it affected the design. So I will need to then move it, fix it. And if we bring in a building, let's say 200 by 200, if 
if I go in a building, we got to start placing the building. We got to start moving things around. And we want to be able to come in and just rotate this quickly. And again, it could be multiple buildings. Let's say in this case, I'm going to copy and paste. Edit. Let's copy, paste another one. And we'll start the solver. And it automatically knows we got to take care of that. Let's bring in a driveway. Let's do a zoom back over. Again, we can come under layout, grab another tool. And we even have other tools such as the sweat path. Won't really get into that in uh, this session today. But we have a sweat path analysis that will allow you to look at vehicle movement and should we make changes or should we not, especially at intersections. Uh, so I want to come in, bring this. Let's get rid of the returns where you want to go in, in the front. And at this point, you know, I could even get, depending on what you want to do with a project, I could bring this right out into the middle. Get a lot of different ways to start playing with how things are going to interact uh, with a project. Now, the one thing I want everybody also see and understand, inside site ops, it's not about, again, just doing a good-looking design, doing it quickly. It better be constructible, and it better be good. Because if the client doesn't get those, that's where you lose a client, is if there's issues as we go further into construction phase. So what I'm showing here. It's just red inside the parking lot. Those little red dots mean, hey, you've got enough room for the parking space, but there's an accessibility issue. In this case, it's the drive aisle is not being met. There's a problem. And if you notice, it says 17 spaces because only 17 are good. Now, I can always come in, and there's this is things you can do inside. I can tell site ops is not your problem. It's mine. You know, Maybe I'm going to come in and do angle parking to for some reason, I, I can solve this problem a lot of different ways, or I may just come back and move it, change properties, move it till it works. But once you get to a certain point, it all comes down again to economics. It comes down to that good design, and this is where I think most people would say the biggest power inside site ops is. I mean, this is really cool. You can draw and design and do all kind of different options really fast. It's about how can we grade it. So I just hit the grading button. Lower right, sort of hard to see, and I know it don't move as well in these online meetings, but it's actually around $450,000 is the budget, but it's looking at thousands to millions of grading plans to say, what is the lowest cost of construction to achieve this design? And if I turn off the boundaries, we can actually see red is cut, blue is filled, yellow means a little elevation change. We can see what's happening on the project. Imagine you build a project and it says it's not feasible because the client says, I don't want walls, but they need it. That's the kind of thing they need to know right away. Say, so, you know what? Your design doesn't work. What you want doesn't work. I either come up with another option or we're going to build a wall and it works. So let's fast forward this project let's, just so I can start showing some things. Because the idea is, again, we make a design. We spend, I think the one I'm going to show you, I got maybe 30 minutes into it. Uh, so we're going to say no on that. And we're going to open up one that's had a little more exactness put to us. Let's say it that way. So we have the driveways like you saw. I got a couple parking lots. I went in and threw some bay points. Uh, let's start layout solver again just so you can see there are components in there where I can move it around and change it. I got a building footprint, and we're going to use the same building that you saw in the PowerPoint slide from AECOSIM. Uh, it's just a low residential version. It's a low rise, not the, not the mid rise like you saw in that, that image. But we have got the footprint. Now, I could bring those into site ops. That's not a problem. We can bring them as a thing called a block. And if a user has that, uh, we can bring these in uh, any way you want. You see, I have tons of blocks all throughout my, my slide over here. I could bring in a low rise. Uh, we can bring that in. And it'll actually give me some boundaries. It'll make it look really similar to what we see on the screen. But it's going to let me pick and choose because, again, seeing components of it in a very basic form will let me help define the outline of that structure. And again, imagine in this case we're going to use seven of the same building, but it could be a lot more different, you know, a lot of different buildings. As you can see, let's rotate this just a little bit just so it roughly matches that other view. There's the building. And if I go up to our viewer, again, we have a, a sort of a basic viewer. You can see I got some colors on these buildings. We'll talk about that in a minute. But if I hardware render it, give it just a second, it should pop up that other building. It may take a moment. There it is. You can actually see. Roll this around. You can see the other building come up in white. And again, we'll show you in a minute what it looks like when it goes completely out. All right. So just want to let you know you can bring those in so that you have that reference so that you can see what the building looks like. 
So let's go back in and let's grade this again real quick. Just because I opened it up, I need to regrade it. We're going to start talking about how to take it to the next level. Now, one thing you can do, and I want to show inside this view and talk about it now, is we can add heights to these buildings. Again, it's not very fancy. And we've learned this from the past. In the past, we used to the users used to do some really wild things. And they used to get really aggressive with the building and show those real models. Well, a lot of times on the site side, you may not have those building models yet. And what tends to happen is when you go in a meeting with the client, they don't really talk about the site, which is what you're there for. They tend to start obsessing on the building itself. And unless you're the architect that, you know, for us, most of us civils that do site, I'm not an architect. That's their job. I want to talk about the site. So we made it where they could extract the building shapes upward. You can set the height. And then you can even set the color so that you could have different designations for those buildings as you go out. And again, be able to show this. Now, again, this is just a grading viewer. I'm going to show you a, a publisher tool that we got. I'm in a test environment, so I can show you something new coming up. But I want to get this out to Luminar T ultimately. And I showed you that image earlier of the one building with the with the wave looking roof that had cars and trees and all that that I talked about. We're going to go in and talk about how to take a basic site ops design or any site ops design. It could be residential. I want a house on every lot. And I want to start making this something different. So we put in tools. Let me just go in, take care of some of the layers again. I'm going to zoom in, take that image down in the back. And we've made some items for you. Now, in the full tool, this what I'm going to show you, this little section in the upper right, where these are Luminar T proxies. These are Luminar T models. Cars, trees that sway with the wind, um, all kind of different things, plants. I've just got a small section here. Again, I'm in test environment, but there are tons of this stuff in here for you automatically. So I just wanted to let you know that. What you see is not all that there is. So what I want to do is I want to go into draw. We're going to draw a quick path. I'm just going to encompass this area. And we're going to bring in maybe three cars. We'll keep this really simple. I'm going to offset this. Offset, offset, and, oh, sorry about that. That is a user error on the clicking. Let's offset one more time. So, again, just use an offset command. Most of us have seen this. Let's bring in, we'll bring a car. Let's just bring in a Chevy Impala. And then let's go out and grab a Dodge Ram pickup truck. And then I also want to bring in a tree. Let's go with a dogwood. I like that for parking lot. I'm going to show you how we're going to change this. Again, this is one of the things we're able to do because what we're ultimately doing, and this is what we want, right, is BIM. It's about a model. When we look at the Revit, the Ecosim, the BIM world, it's all about creating that model and being able to work in that environment. Site ops, even though we're looking 2D, we are creating a three-dimensional model. So we want to add 3D models whenever we can to this model, to, again, to give us that vibrant design. And, we're going, and we make it simple for you. So if I want to add cars to a parking lot, SiteOps knows this is a parking lot. It knows the parking space. It knows it's a parking island. It knows every little thing about this project. It knows this is a sidewalk. It knows that this is a building. So what I want to do is go to this area here, which right now it doesn't know anything about. I'm going to tell it. And this is a block boundary. And I'm going to go over to the right and say it's parking. Now you can see it's already in the parking spaces. I can change, let's say, 30%. And I want to rotate. 10% of them backwards instead of frontwards. Again, so it gives them that randomness. All I need to do now is just assign one of those cars to that area. We're going to do the other one real quick just so you can see it again. Block, parking, we'll leave that the same. Assign a block. What do I want to make it? One more time. We'll add that third one in. Parking, sign. That easy. I've just added a whole, whole bunch of detail to this project. And I'm going to come in and do it one last time. This time, I'm going to do the tree, but I'm going to tell it it's islands. And if you notice, they went into the island. There's a double here. We can clean that up. I'll show you how we do that in a minute. It's going to be pretty simple. If you do, by chance do see a double, just click on one and delete it. Simple as that. So let's get rid of this one. We'll get rid of these extra couples because we don't need them anymore. So now, I've now just made a 3D model that has 3D models referenced into it. Now, here's another really cool thing. This is one thing that I love about this. What if the client wants to change this parking lot and make it bigger? If you notice, the cars will move along with it. So now that when I come back in, I change my design, everything else will start changing with it. 
So we can start playing with this design to start looking for what is the best way to do this project. And we can just move, move different bits and pieces across. So we can constantly play and edit and move, and things are going to do it for us. Because think about it, a lot of time we don't do those 3D things because of, again revision happens. You got to do half that work again. We don't want you to do any of that work. If I raise a building and it has to regrade, which means if I raise this building two feet, it will cascade that grading all throughout the project. Guess what? All those pieces move with us. So let's see the grading button one more time, and I want to apply that to the model. Now, this is a very simple part. We've created it. Now, how are we going to turn it into something? Okay, there's two things I'm going to show you that are pretty simple. Now, I can export site ops to tons of things. I can export to DWG, uh, DGN, Collada files, KMZ files. I can take it straight to Google Earth and do that. Uh, if I'm doing trees and cars, buildings, Google Earth has an issue with memory, so it can be a little slow. If I want to go to Luminar T, you just go straight out to Luminar T. I tell it, let's go to Luminar T, and it exports. It takes a couple minutes. But I'm going to save you the time of that. I already done one. But I do want to show everyone something new. If you haven't seen this before, it's a publishing tool. Because one thing we found from some of the users is the Luminar T models are really awesome. But maybe it's a little further than even, you know, I've already, I want the client to see two or three versions before I hand something that's Luminar T style. So we create a thing called a publisher. And what this is going to allow us to do, and we're going to call this October Tech Talk. It's going to allow me to take data. And again, this is still a prototype. We've got a lot more things to add to it. And I want to come in and I want to take this and I want to take that model and I want to add it to something called Cesium. Now, the other part of when we're doing a delivering to a client is how we deliver it. Okay? Luminar T is unbelievable. We can do virtual reality you know, with, the, with the glasses or Oculus. You can make movies. You can take images. You can do a live cube where you can send them the real model sort of dumbed down with a control so they can move and rotate. Sometimes those files are large. What if I just need a quick answer? Take a look at this real quick and tell me what you think. You publish this out and it's going to be a, new, a URL that you can just copy and paste and send to them. It's a web page. And that's the really cool part. I've now put a model into a web page that they can see and use. And that web page, again, is in a product called CCM that is just like looking at Google Earth, but guess what? I got the 3D surface, and if I brought in, if you bring in most models, any of you ever tried, to uh, Google Earth, you, if I've done some grading, I've done some surface modeling, you cannot change it. You have to sort of float it above. We're changing this surface. That pond is graded in. I don't see the trees underneath poking through it like I would in other products. I can now see my cars. We dull them down a little bit. In Luminar T, they'll come out colors and metallic looking here. We keep it down against about speed and looking at options. And I can, and one thing we're working on, for example, is being able to add notes and be able to add some information about the actual buildings themselves individually, about parking. Point We call them points of interest. On the left, we can see some information. I could add my general notes. I can look at a budget. The client could then turn and look at, all right, you come up with a number. How'd you get there? What is the cut, the fill, the import, the export? Uh, again, what have you done? And you do have the option of saying no budgets, no quantities. Again, you may not want them to know anything. Just look at the design. Tell me what you think. But this is the neat part. We're right here beside the Seattle uh, Seahawks training camp. Probably a nice piece of property, a high dollar. But we need to make sure we're getting the value out of that, and the client does too. We've done that fairly simple and easy. But let's say I want to take this again to that next level created that site ops design that has everything in there that I want, and I've exported it to Luminar T, this is what comes out of site ops to Luminar T. I told it in my one model to add some trees around the perimeter. I can use similar to the way I did parking. I can put it and put some randomization, tell it multiple models to put in there, and it looks like this. The buildings, the cars, and here's the beauty. This is a fantastic tool. I can actually, if we look in the background, I made the highway have traffic. We zoom in, I can see my pond. It actually will reflect light if it's a wet pond or the bay that's out there. You can see it. I mean, what if I zoom in? We, trees are moving with the wind, everything's swaying. I can come in and just look at this. And one of the things I really love, again, it's all about the environment. Uh, we can really go into some high level resolution. I'm going to let it sit here for a minute because, again, I know being uh, presented online, sometimes it can be a little slow. But one of my favorite things as well is. What if we want to show the time of day? Do we have enough lights? Do I need to put more street lights in? Uh, our cars, as they're going by a facility, are going to shine. For example, work with a user one time. They're doing a 
a, a small grocery store up against the residential, the whole issue was when delivery trucks come early in the morning, are they going to be able to light or the air going to be able to see it? How, how much of a buffer they needed to plant? So they didn't use Luminar T and Side Ops the first time. It was all about, hey, I just want to quickly use Side Ops, come up with something, and I'm going to do it. They were able to actually go back with Luminar T, add in the foliages they needed, show the truck sitting there with the lights on, and then be able to say, you know what, lights aren't making it through the trees. So you're good. And they were able to get the residents of the next door community to understand what's going on and approve the project. So as we can see, I can quickly come in again. And I'm no expert at this software. I'm not a, an architect. I'm a, a civil, just like most of y'all on here. But the idea that within just a few minutes, I was able to create a nice little environment and be able to show things. That's really cool because I can present this to the client. The client can present this to who they're selling to. You know, we got to sell this to the community. Definitely. Uh, but I can show that. You know, we can go in down into the entrance. I can see the moving vehicles. I mean, imagine somebody going, well, what does the entrance look like? You know, how, how bad is it going to look? So let's just roll around real quick, drop into this view. So when we're talking about a vibrant design. This is what we're talking about. This is the kind of thing that will help win clients, win projects. This is what they all want. They want to see things like this. And our goal is to try to give it to them. But let's be honest, when I got to do 10, 20 layouts, I cannot give this to them without this kind of speed. Otherwise, it's just not economical. I got to have a whole nother part of a company. I know companies that have whole divisions whose only job is to take a 2D layout and turn it into this. That's a lot of manpower. That's a lot of effort that probably needs to be spent more on working on that ultimate design, that final one that everybody loves, instead of this one, which is still just trying to get buy-in. And again, if I had buy-in, we could go even further into detail in this. You know, where I'm going to put trash dumpsters. And you know, over here, for example, I just threw in maybe uh, get the client to understand. We have a little dog and the owners over here in the side. But we're going to definitely need more. We need playgrounds. We're going to need everything else. There's my dog walking if I zoom in. Again, all about design intent. So, again, today's Tech Talk was about bringing vibrant design, being able to take your design from one level to the next, be able to take it from site ops to Luminar T to be able to stand out, use that as a competitive edge. So I hope I was able to show that. Um, so some benefits from using this, um, we're seeing it used across multiple industries. Um, again, you can do quick site designs, give them those upfront options, but with 3D reality modeling, bring that in there. You're going to increase your ROI. We see a lot of people use this for business development. Imagine sitting in front of a client they call or they call you up and say, we're looking at this piece of property, want to want to put in some residential. You throw something together real quick, you go over to their office that day, next day, and say, All right, here's what I'm thinking. That will blow them away. That is the wow they're looking for. And you're going to exceed those clients' expectations. And when we hear SOPs users using this workflow, we hear it all the time. We make money, we win new business. You know, I've heard people say, I've just shown the grading button to a client, a new potential new client, and won the job on that. Because they understand we're trying to do the best job for them and deliver the best design with the lowest cost. So one challenge also throw people, don't believe it, try it. SiteOps has a free trial. You can go, to, if you're a Bentley user, you can go into the fulfillment, you can get it there. Um, if not, uh, go straight to the Bentley.com. Uh, under products, there's SiteOps. Go down, there's a free trial area right over there. Give it a try yourself. If it looked like it was too easy, I'm not doing anything special. It is as easy as it looks. The hardest thing of using site ops is already knowing what you need. If you don't know why you put a building in a certain location, why you do a parking lot, why you do roadways a certain way, site ops aren't going to help you make a great, make you a great designer. It's going to make you a better one. That's it. You're already the skill set you already have is all you need to know, and that's the hardest thing to know to use site ops. Site ops is the rest of it's easy. So let's jump into some questions. All right, David, I have a question for you. Um, how can I bring a Luminar T element into SiteOps? Okay, there's only certain parts of the Luminar T uh, elements that can be brought into SiteOps. Uh, the other ones you'll have to put in once you bring it in there. So, for example, some of the three or four of the actual light posts are not done in proxies. So we're working with Luminar T to try to get more of them across. Most of the cars, the plants, the trees, some of the people, some of these things are already in there. Uh, so that's those what I was doing like with the cars. I would, those are Luminar T objects already embedded in site ops. So they come across cleanly. 
Um, unfortunately, we haven't got them all in there yet, so we're still working with them. Um, so hopefully, before it's all said and done, we will. But that's the that's the easiest way to do it. Okay. Is this program appropriate to design roadways and highways, or would other programs such as Open Roads Concept Station be better for that purpose? Um, Open Roads Concept Station is a fabulous tool. It sort of works the same way. It's about conceptual design. It uses some of that Luminarty technology to create the visuals. And if you're doing a, a basically a DOT level roadway with bridges and things like that, by all means, do it. We do have users that have done more of a local level type roadway system, uh, subdivision type roadways, business parks, schools, those level. If you're looking for something that's going to do bridging and super elevation and things like that, that is not side ops. Again, it just depends on the type of roadway you're looking at. So again, if you want to see more and more detail about roadways, there's some videos out there. I think I did one month ago or two months ago about last month. It was about roadways. So uh, go out and get the tech talk off of, of uh, Bentley's uh, YouTube page or Bentley.com. And if you don't find it, again, contact me. And I will definitely uh, show you what it can do. But it can do some roadway, again, just not the complexity of a uh, big uh, mass movement type roadway. Okay. Can the final design details of conceptual developments be completed in this program, or do we transfer the concept to another program to look at grading, road profiles, and sheet creation? Okay. You're going to be able to go fairly far down with grading. Road profiling, again, I didn't show it, but you can do controls of your roadway, do profiling, have it. It's really cool because if I change the road profile, it cascades throughout the rest of the project and affects everything grading for you. But this is not a final design tool. When we first started making this tool 13 years ago, um, we looked at basically what, what was missing in the industry and what was good. Most of us out there have CAD tools. You know, you have Geopack, Inroads, Open Roads. Microstation-based products, AutoCAD, 12D, whatever it might be, and you're really good. You put time and effort into learning that. We're not here to replace that part. What we realized was in the very beginning that people like myself were spending a lot of time doing conceptual work to get to that point where those tools would really be valuable for us and really take over labeling and annotation and sheet setup and all that kind of stuff, which they're fabulous at. They're fantastic. We're not trying to replace that. That's already in your workflow. You already know it. We want to export it straight. You say, hey, I've done 20 layouts in SiteOps. Client likes number eight. I export that out to my favorite tool, and I finish construction documents. And hopefully, there's no major revisions that you have to go back to SiteOps for. If everything's good, you keep going. If there's a huge major revision, you know, you found rock all over the site that you didn't know about, then maybe you have to go back to SiteOps and do some redesign. But again, hopefully, that part's over with, and you finish in your favorite tool, again, that you okay. already know. Is Luminarty a separate software? Yes, Luminarty is a separate software. Um, it's used by a lot of other ones other than just SiteOps. So, yeah, if you want Luminarty, um, I don't remember the exact cost, but it is a very valuable tool that everybody needs to put in there and it's worth every dollar you pay for it because, again, it delivers things that you cannot deliver. Um, I cannot deliver swaying trees in any other software, that, especially that fast. I, I, I'll go ahead and challenge you. I've sat at a big event that happens in November every year in Las Vegas, and I sat through an hour-long class to show them how to make one car move on the roadway. That highway that I showed you inside Luminar 2T took me less than two minutes to create all those cars moving. You're not going to get this anywhere else, and that's the beauty of it. It's worth its weight in gold to help you to get the design and ten across. And does Luminar T do a fly through? Yes. Oh, it, it, that's one thing I really didn't get the ability to show. Uh, there's a lot of stuff out there to create a movie, basically a fly through. It's literally just take the points you want, then tell it to produce them. They don't do a four up to a 4K video. Phenomenal. I love showing the videos out of this. Um, there's a ton of them. Actually, if you go to YouTube and look up site ops, you'll see a ton of them where I've done Luminar T, where I've done rest stop, everything from rest stops. To you see a couple with that building on there. To I mean, tons of different ones. The the fly through the video production for me again, not a graphics person, not a movie person. I set a couple points and I tell it to produce a movie. It's as easy as that. Okay. Can side outs be exported and used as a topographic surface inside Revit? Uh, yeah, you can bring that in. Uh, you'd bring it through the Land XML file. But yeah, we do have uh, Revit users that will come in and use that surface that. Uh, is in there, and then they can use skirts or other things to try to make that uh, into, depending on what their ultimate goal is, 
to make that into something that they would want to use. So yeah, you can most definitely do that. Okay. And what is the use of SiteOps Doc Center? Uh, SiteOps Doc Center is sort of a low-level CAD tool. We have a lot of users that are, for example, land development, real estate people that just want to add some basic annotation. It's nowhere near the level of what we need as full-blown designers. If I'm doing, for example, I'm not going to have roadway cross section. I'm not going to have all that again, plan production level stuff that you need as an engineer and architect. It was more for, again, a number of people that are out there that just want a little bit of something to help them do plan production. Uh, we also, uh, one thing about software we sell, we do sell a lot, even though we're a Bentley product, to the uh, Autodesk community. A lot of them were asking me, hey, can I just get a little glimpse into the microstation, a little something to play with? Again, I know it's not a full tool, but something that I can taste and get an understanding of what it's like. And we've seen a lot of people that have started using that. Again, in that conceptual phase, let's throw a quick border together. Let's do something, again, to present our drawing to the client. But we're hoping the publisher maybe will replace some of that as well, that you just go straight to the publisher and use that instead. Okay. How long does it take to learn SiteOps and become a good user? Well, it's like any software. Take some time. Uh, we get this question every time, and it's, it's the biggest worry every company has. I had it when I had a company. You bring something new in. Is it going to be shelfware? Am I going to get value out of it? So if you want to come to training in Charlotte, North Carolina, or have one of our trainers come to you, it takes about two and a half to three days, uh, depending on uh, what's going on. A lot of people bring projects with them so they can make it billable. Um, but that's all we used to learn. We, again, there's not a lot of drop downs. There are no typing commands. There's a few I use just because I'm old school. But you saw everything about the software. It's it's on there. There's not a lot of hidden stuff. You don't have to have a lot of admin training, things like that. So when you come and train, it's more about using the tool. And it's really about the mindset that you're now working inside of a model. You make a change, and there's going to be a, a recourse for doing that. I may have told the the building to raise two feet, and I, but I've told it no walls. I may have to have a wall. So how do we solve? It's almost how do we solve issues in our design as we're using a tool like this. But do a couple projects with it, and you'll be absolutely fine. You'll probably be fine on the first project. Again, it's very easy to use. Okay. Going back to Doc Center, is SiteOps Doc Center a separate tool? It is a separate tool. It comes with SiteOps, but it is a separate tool. Uh, you would export out to it just like you would uh, any of the other tools. Okay. Uh, one more question. Can the unit cost be updated for the location of the project? Yeah, by all means. we got site offs being used throughout the world. Um, there's a default property area that we just sort of thrown in some of the some of the averages for the U.S. for things like 9 by 18 parking space, that's 24-foot drive aisles, all the way down to some basic unit cost. But you would want to do that based on your location. And you can take out the spreadsheet, send it to somebody, and then bring it back in. Uh, we have a system for being able to you know, for most of us, I'd give it to a contractor friend said, hey, can you just fill in these few? It's not that many. Uh, fill in these few quantities and what's cut and fill, import, export. What's, you know, what's the running foot for a uh, flared insect? Or flared insect would be an individual cost, but for pipe, different things like that. So that when I put it in there, um, it, it'll know, and then you can save it. So the next time you do a project, you know, if I don't normally work in, I don't work in Seattle, but if I get some info, the next time I go back, all I got to do is open that default property. I'm good to go. And they only take a few minutes to set up. Nothing, nothing big. Okay. Can you export 3D SiteOps elements into MicroStation, and would it take Luxology materials and rendering tools to do that? Um, when you export out, you're going to export basically the surface models, things like that. So any texturing, anything you want to add to that inside of MicroStation would have to be individual, would have to be done through like um, Lexology. Some of those other tools that are out there, we're, you know, we're going to pass over what we have. Uh, but I do tell most people, for example, if I go to MicroStation and I got that building somewhere else because we most likely have an I-model or some other comma, common structure, I would take SiteOps out and rebring that building in there. Um, just because, again, through the workflows and speed of most people's computers, uh, there's some things we sort of teach in training that you can still do it, but it's a little better to do it maybe in the tool where your ultimate destination is. It just depends on the typical uh, workflow and, and what you have for a computer. To run site ops, you don't need a great computer. You, you, can, you can get by with a really old computer. If you're running any CAD program, you got way better computer than you need for site ops. A lot of it depends on what, are you, what do you have for where you're going with the software 
are going with your okay. design? Those are all the questions we have for right now.